Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can... You can please stand through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from malice and cleanse me from sin against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit out of me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your, a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guilt, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would have given it. You will not be pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Sion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Please welcome back Dr. Stephen Smith. Okay, let's get into our presentation tonight. Uh, to recap and to prepare for tonight, last week we tried to put on lenses. I use the metaphor of putting on and getting uh, an eye checkup, and putting on the right lenses is crucial to seeing. And I suggested that so many people read Genesis without the right glasses on and don't really understand what they're seeing, what they're reading. So last week we tried to look through at Genesis 1 through the ancient Jewish lens of what I call, and others call, temple cosmology, um, which simply means this. There are various literary clues and theological clues uh, that unveiled several mysteries that we looked at last week. First, that the author of Genesis deliberately depicts all of creation as God's temple, as his divine sanctuary, with Eden as the holy place. So if you're looking at um, an illustration of the temple, uh, we talked about how this would be the holy place of the temple, or if you, if you like on the illustration here, if I can pull it up here. Um, well, here it is in the tabernacle of the wilderness, the holy place, right? And the holy of holies separated by a veil behind the holy place. So we were looking at uh, the perspective of creation as a temple with Eden as that very sacred and holy place. And in some sense, then, the tree of life represents the holy of holies, okay? That's a bit from last week, just by way of review. Um, so that was the first major discovery. And then the second one is the repeated presence of sevens in the text. Some of these were probably obvious when you followed along and said, okay, yeah, seven days of creation. But then there were others that were maybe less obvious. Some of the terms that were used and the repetitions there, right? And you have the notes from last week. Um, what does that mean? What do the sevens reveal? Well, we tried to show how the sevens in the text of Genesis 1 reveals how God sevens himself. That is to say, how he binds himself or covenants with the whole of creation. Leading up to the climax, which is the seventh day, the Shabbat. Right? God brings creation and man, in particular, into existence, into relationship with himself, 
And this perfecting of creation and perfecting of man, uh, which leads to the Sabbath, leads us to one conclusion, that the creation and humanity in particular was created for worship. Say the following sentence with me. We were created for worship. We were created for worship. That's the main point to take away from last week. It's not just these curiosities that, you know, Eden's like a temple and all these kinds of interesting things. It's pointing us towards this greater truth. Creation was created for worship, and we were created for worship. Okay, so that's last week. Tonight, we're going to concentrate on the next two chapters, Genesis 2 and 3. Now, we're not going to go through and do a verse-by-verse uh, exegesis of the text. We're taking a particular slant, a particular look, and that is, again, through this lens of liturgy. So tonight we're going to concentrate on Genesis 2 and 3 and how the author of Genesis portrays the guardianship of the temple of creation by a particular figure, the royal high priest, who is Adam. Finally, as we draw our series to an end, I want to explore with you some practical implications of our study, to draw it all together and to bring it home. Okay? Now, um, before discussing Adam's royal status or his high priestly role in creation, we have to begin by reviewing that the creation of Adam was the creation of God's son. Right? You say, well, wait a minute, that's not right. Jesus is God's son, right? Indeed, Jesus is God's one and only begotten son, the divine son of God. But without a question, Genesis portrays Adam as the son of God. Follow along with me, if you would, letter B under Roman numeral 2. That Adam is the, quote, son of the father is implicit in Genesis 2. It doesn't come right out and say it, but it's implicit in a number of ways. Um, in John Paul II's Theology of the Body, he refers just matter-of-factly to Adam as the son of the father, right? Um, but it is also explicitly stated in Luke's Gospel, in the genealogy of Jesus, which he presents in Luke 3, where he says, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Right? So, let's contemplate this. Let's try to absorb this. The sonship of Adam, what does that mean in relation to God the Father? Well, the sonship of Adam grounds and informs everything else that is communicated about Adam in Scripture. Adam's sonship identity, or the technical term filial identity, is the source of his immeasurable dignity before the Father, before God the Father, and assures his unique role. In a number of ways, the documents of Vatican II affirm this, affirm this filial role of Adam as it relates to Jesus Christ, the new Adam, and, as I said, the true Son of the Father. And so here are just four uh, ways that Vatican II talks about the sonship of Adam, and I think this will lay a nice foundation for everything we're going to do beyond it. So let's just review some things Vatican II teaches us about Adam. First, from Gaudium et Spes, uh, paragraph 22, it says this, the truth is that only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on light. For Adam, the first man, was a figure or a type of him who was to come. And there Vatican II is quoting St. Paul in Romans, namely Christ the Lord. Christ, the final Adam, by the revelation of the mystery of the Father and his love, fully reveals man to himself and makes his, that is man's, supreme calling clear. It's not surprising, then, Vatican II says, that in him, in Christ, all the aforementioned truths find their root and attain their crown. And just as an aside, let's just say something about God at best, just as a side, and that is that, you know, many people are searching for God. Who is God? What is he like? But I would argue that it's only in the fullness of the truth and the Catholic faith that we not only understand who God is, but also who we are. And God at best reminds us of that, right? That... Gaudium et Spes, Vatican II is saying Christ reveals who we are to ourselves. If you want to understand who you are, you know, look in the mirror, right? What Vatican II says, don't just look in the mirror, look at Christ. Christ reveals not just who God is, but also who we are. It's very profound. Okay, next quote is from Lumen Gentium, 
And it says this, the eternal father by a free and hidden plan of his own wisdom and goodness created the whole world. His plan was to raise men to a participation in the, of the divine life, participation in the blessed trinity. Fallen in Adam, God the Father did not leave man, men to themselves, but ceaselessly offers, offered helps to salvation in view of or with a view to Christ, the Redeemer who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Once again, uh, referring to St. Paul. A third quote on Adam in Vatican II from Agentes, for Jesus Christ was sent into the world as a real mediator between God and men. Since he is God, all divine fullness dwells bodily in him. According to his human nature, on the other hand, he is the new Adam, made head of a renewed humanity and full of grace and truth. Um, you may want to make a little note that this phrase, made the head of a renewed humanity, is kind of where we're going tonight. This anticipates what we're going to be talking about tonight. Therefore, the Son of God walked the ways of a true incarnation that he might make men sharers or partakers in the nature of God. There's that idea again, right? Made poor for our sakes, though he had been rich, so that his poverty might enrich us. And then the last one from Presbyter Orum Ordinus, on the priesthood it says this, by this obedience Christ conquered and made up for the disobedience of Adam. So, as the Apostle St. Paul testifies, for as by the disobedience of one man many were made sinners, that is Adam, so also by the obedience of one man, Christ the new Adam, many shall be made just. Christ, in other words, recapitulates the first Adam. And that's a little bit of a tease for this coming Sunday night. I hope you join us um, at St. John uh, the Apostle in Leesburg. Um, and I'll be speaking about uh, Joseph, Joshua, and Jesus, and how both of those prefigure Jesus Christ. But I'm going to introduce you to a theme that I think is going to really excite you called recapitulation in Christ. I'll explain more of that on Sunday evening. So these four quotes from Vatican II remind us that Vatican II put a big uh, interest in the figure of Adam in explaining what the church is up to in the modern world. And not just Adam, but Adam as the Son of God. Now, having laid the foundation with the wisdom of the church in the documents of Vatican II, let us now delve deeper into Genesis and explore the contents of chapter 2 and 3, where Adam is presented not just as the Son of God, but firstly as the royal Son of the Father, and secondly as the high priesthood, as the high priest of the Father. Okay? So, Roman number three, the royal high priesthood of Adam. Numerous clues in Genesis suggest both a royal status of Adam, in other words, as a kingly figure, and, I think more importantly, as a priestly figure, specifically as the royal high priest of the Temple of Eden. Again, building on what we talked about last week. So let's first explore this royal sonship, then we'll talk about the high priesthood, okay? So first, just focusing on this one image of Adam as the royal son of God. Here are some of the, what I think are the more important clues that point in that direction. Number one, Adam is with Eve, made in the imago dei, that is, in the image of God, Genesis 1.28. So man is the crown and climax of creation. He's created by the Lord God, and this is important, right, who himself, the Lord himself, is described numerous times in Scripture as king of all the earth. So it would follow, right, if God the Father, right, fashions his son, right, taken out of the ground, right, Adam is the son of God, and if God the Father is king, then in some sense Adam is his prince, right, or a kingly figure. Well, where does it say that God is king over all the earth? Well, numerous places. I just picked out three from the Psalms just to, to hammer it home. First from Psalm 10, the Lord is king forever and ever. 
Psalm 47, for the Lord is terrible, a great king over all the earth. And lastly, Psalm 74, yet God, my king, is from old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. And as I said, I could give you many, many more explicit um, citations from Scripture. So first, we see that God the Father is, in many ways, called king in Scripture. But secondly, the world that Adam inherits in Eden and the world that he dwells in is filled with royal imagery, the kind of descriptions that would, you would see in a royal kingdom, in a royal household. Uh, consider, for example, just the land itself is described as, where it says, and the gold of that land is good, bdellium and onyx stone are there in Eden, Genesis 2.12. Further, point three, Adam is given stewardship over the garden. Decreed by God to name every beast of the field and every bird of the air, brought to the man to see what he, not what God, but what he, Adam, would call them. And as it says, whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. This suggests that Adam is, as some scholars describe it, co-regent with God over creation, enjoying the status of a royal son of the king. Uh, you have to realize that uh, naming something in Scripture is tantamount to describing its identity and its destiny. Now, there are a few stumpers because sometimes someone will throw at me some obscure name and I'll say, that's a riddle to me, right, what it, what it means in terms of their identity. But I would say at least three quarters of the time, names in Scripture, both in the Old and in the New Testament, uh, depict the identity and where that person is going. Example, Moshe, Moses, from the waters, right, taken from the waters. It tells us what about his miraculous birth, Right? And it also points forward to the Red Sea where he leads the Israelites from the waters. Okay? Yeshua, Jesus, the Lord saves. I'm going to get into that on uh, Sunday night as well with Joshua and Jesus. So naming is about much more than calling a thing a thing right? and distinguishing it from something else. So when God tells Adam to name every living thing, he gives this uh, creative power to Adam. And by the way, by way of application, that means that because we are sons and daughters of Adam, we too enjoy that royal status. We are, in some sense, co-creators with God, right? As parents, as husbands and wives, as stewards of the earth, in our workplaces, in our schools, in many different ways to be co-creators and to bring and extend God's temple over the face of the earth. So Adam is given stewardship over the garden, and in this way, another example of his royal sonship. Yet, and this is a very important point, point number four, Adam's co-regency with God, his royal status, was not, repeat, was not limited to the sacred space of the Temple of Eden. Uh, one scholar, Greg Beale, evangelical scholar, observes this. Not only was Adam to serve as priest king in the initial stage of the Edenic sanctuary, in other words, the Temple of Eden, but Genesis 1.28 affirms that he was to subdue the entire earth. In other words, there's a sense, again, to draw upon last week, that this is where Adam dwells, right, in the holy place as God's priest, bringing order to God's temple. But he wasn't supposed to simply live here only. He was made to go out of the temple and to bring this order of perfection of Eden to the ends of the earth. And you see that, for example, in Genesis 1.28, where it says, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And by subduing it, it doesn't mean to suppress or to oppress, but to bring that temple perfection and order, which is within the temple, to the wilds beyond, right? It's like saying to Israel, go out, right, and be a light to the nations. Or if you will, in the New Testament, Jesus Christ saying in the Great Commission, go and make disciples, right, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and lo, I'm with you always, right, even to the end of the age, right, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? Jesus Christ is the ultimate temple builder. Jesus Christ is the ultimate Adam. So Adam's temple building commission 
Roman numeral five, bottom of the page, was to extend, was extended to later figures. In other words, you see this repetition, consider Noah. Did you know that God said be fruitful and multiply to Noah? He does. In Genesis 9, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And you be fruitful and multiply and bring forth abundantly over the earth and multiply in it. Now, is there something in here about um, the gospel of life, about fertility? Yes and yes, for sure. But reading the scripture according to this kind of divine sanctuary um, pattern, I would argue that it's about much more than making babies, even though that's a big, big part of it. Right? It's about bringing God's fruitfulness, God's life, God's perfecting order to the entire earth. In the same way, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, on the next page, I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will multiply exceedingly. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. By the way, in, in Genesis 17, God also says to Abraham, and kings will come forth from you, connecting that royal imagery once again. Finally, to all of Israel, Thus Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied exceedingly. As one scholar sums up, a royal statute at a distant corner of the empire in the ancient world represented the king's authority when the king could not physically be present. So at the completion of God's creation, God left Adam as his image to represent his authority in the garden his authority on earth. This suggests that the function of the image is to reflect the divine will on earth in such a way as to extend God's kingdom into every area of nature, society, and culture. This is exactly what happens with the man in Genesis 2. It's about a lot more than naming the animals, right? It's about bringing God's order right, to nature, society, and culture beyond Eden. Now, let's move on from Adam's royal role, so I think you probably got the idea, right, to a, the second point, and that is Adam's high priestly role. And this is where things really get kind of fascinating. Adam the great horticulturalist, and notice that I have that word scratched out. Because I'm asking, asking the question, is, is Adam simply a farmer? And you hear this interpretation sometimes. Adam had a green thumb, right? Well, building on last week's theme, the question could be readily asked, right? What is a temple, what is this, without a high priest in it, right? So let's look at some texts. In Genesis 2, verse 15, we, we read, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to serve and protect it. Now I want to introduce you to two Hebrew words. The first word, and before I ask you to repeat it. The B sound in, in Hebrew is really more of a soft B or a V sound. So it's not abad, but really avad. Can you say it with me? Avad. avad right? And the second verb is shamar. Shamar. Okay. Now, those are the two words that appear in Genesis 2.15. The Lord God took the man, put him into the garden to serve and to protect it. Um, but contrary to popular misconception, Adam is not merely a farmer or gardener or horticulturalist. Weekend, weekend gardener, right? Many English Bibles translate these verbs, in my view, sloppily as to till and to keep it. Now, what's the problem? I'm going to explain. The latter, that is to keep, is less problematic than the former, that is to till. Nevertheless, the impression given in such translations of both verbs is that Adam is busy plowing and harvesting. Only reinforced by the ancient notion of the agrarian societies and so on, right? Yet such possibilities are less common and less plausible given our context. Now, I think you just have a, a black and white version of my little color wheel here, but I think it works just as well. So I'll try to show this to you and do a little word study with you just very briefly. Bottom of the page. We're talking here about these two verbs, trying to understand what's the best way to translate them. There's a payoff here, so stay with me. Word studies show that of the 289 occurrences of avad in the Old Testament, the sense of tilling 
is there but is less common. How less common? Only three clear-cut ones out of the 289. Working a little bit more, seven out of 289, but still very, very low. And plowing just one clear-cut out of 289, looking at the context. You can look it up for yourself, Deuteronomy 21, verse 4. Now, in contrast, the sense of worshiping or serving is common in 123 of 289. So mathematically, right, tilling the garden, couple, right, by looking at the context in other places. And all these, on the word wheel here, what you have, you can see very, very um, clearly is that to serve or to worship, right, down here on the, the wheel, right, to the, to the left and to the bottom, right? Those are the number of occurrences. It's clearer in, in color with the red and blue, but I think it's clear enough. And you can see to till is kind of a little tiny sliver there over on the right, according to context. So just mathematically, the word avad, many more times in scripture, refers to worshiping or serving or ministering then it is uh, ministering or serving 59 times, ministering 37, okay? Turn the page if you would. But it's not a matter of mere um, mathematics, right? Here's the question. Okay, what did God expect Adam to do when he said Avad and Shamar? Hey, Adam, go Avad and Shamar, right? Well, here's where it gets interesting. The two words together, Avad and Shamar, are essential to understanding Adam's true identity and purpose given to him by God in Genesis. As we indicated, the likelihood of Avad and Shamar conating tilling and keeping is minimal. It's there, but it's minimal, based upon mathematical probability alone. Yet we can go beyond mathematics here and offer a sound and concrete solution based upon Scripture itself. One scholar says this, both verbs are commonly used in a religious sense of serving God, as I showed you. They occur, note this, often together in early priestly texts, such as Leviticus, especially as it pertains to the tabernacle duties of Levitical priests. In other words, this is seen in a number of texts beyond Genesis, all having to do with priestly duties. Now here it gets really neat. Moreover, when Shamar and Avad appear in Scripture within an approximately 15-word range, they always, always ref are in reference to priestly duties. Let me say that again. Every time the two words appear together, now maybe not in the same verse, but within 15 words of one another, they always, always refer to priestly actions in the temple. Consider Numbers chapter 3. They shall keep guard over they shall keep guard over him and over the whole congregation before the tent of meeting or tabernacle as they minister at the tabernacle, Shamar and Avad. They shall guard over the furnishings of the tabernacle and keep guard over the people of Israel as they minister at the tabernacle. Again in Numbers 8, another example. They minister to their brothers in the tabernacle by keeping guard, but they shall do no service, priestly service that is, again, Shamar and Avad. So Gordon Wenham, among others, rightly concludes that it is striking that in Genesis and in the priestly law, these two terms are juxtaposed, another pointer, he says, to the interplay between tabernacle and Eden. In other words, one way of saying this is that the author of Genesis is deliberately planting two priestly verbs in the context of Genesis 2 as if to point out to us what Adam's role was to do. He was to be, you might say, the archetypal priest. And those two words, while it can be debated, that you can see there's various meanings, both mathematically and also when you put the two words together, point very overwhelmingly to a priestly identity of Adam. So let's sum up here. The intention of Genesis seems unmistakable. Just as priests and Levites served and guarded sacred spaces, so the man was charged to serve and to guard the garden. Now, one of the things I'm going to argue is that the high priest offers sacrifices, right? This high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, to bring it back up here, once a year, right? Right into this place, only once a year on the Day of Atonement. No one else in there except the high priest and only once a year, right? Here's the holy place, and just outside of it is where the priests, on a daily basis, numerous times a day, offered sacrifices. So, what do priests do in the temple? Well, part of their role is sacrifice. 
But guess what? Another role was not only sacrifice, but also guarding the temple. And that's where that word shamar seems to make a lot of sense. Because we're going to look at how Adam, as high priest, was not willing to offer sacrifice when the moment called for it, nor was he really guarding the temple. In my series on the uh, temple, a few of you purchased it, you'll learn about every nook and cranny of the temple, but you'll learn how the Levites were really like temple police. And many of the Levites, that is to say, Levitical men who were um, not of the descendants of Aaron, so they could not be priests, um, nevertheless had a very important role in the temple. What did they do? Well, they assisted the priests, kind of like deacons in a sense, right? They had a very important role. But part of their role was gatekeepers. They were there to assure that people did not trespass into more holy places that didn't belong there. For example, the main one, right, between the court of the Gentiles, which is, let me bring up my little red here. Okay, not working. Out here, anywhere out here, the court of the Gentiles, right, from the inner place, right, the courts where Israelites could go. There were guards there, right? So in a sense, you could say that Adam's role was twofold. As the high priest, he was called to offer sacrifices of what we'll get to, and also to guard and protect this holy soil of the temple. How did he do on both? Well, that's Genesis 3, okay? All right, uh, number two at the bottom of the page. The picture's clear. A proper translation of Avad and Shamar in Genesis 2 rules out, I think, Adam as a horticulturalist, right? That's a, just a two-dimensional simplistic reading, and instead reveals something much more profound and mysterious, that Adam is being portrayed as the holy high priest of this temple of Eden. When we read Scripture, when we read Genesis in the broader canonical context, right, that's what the catechism tells us to do. Read in light of the whole scripture, right? Genesis reveals that Adam was called to serve and to worship God, to protect and to guard God's holy temple. That is the substance of Genesis 2.15. Now, let's go a bit further. Adam was not just the high priest. He was a glorious high priest. In other words, before the fall, we could say that Adam was, as the Imago Dei, right, the very image, in the most spectacular sense, of what a priest was called to be. Um, when you, uh, if you read the book of Sirach, a very beautiful book written uh, several hundred years before the time of Christ, um, the last chapter is a hymn to the high priest in Sirach's own day. And you want some beautiful reading, go read Sirach chapter 50. It's a spectacular ode to the high priest, and it goes on and on and on in the most colorful, literally colorful terms, describing the array, the rainbow of colors, right, and the vestments of the high priest. Why? Why do you think it does that? Why do you think that the high priests, why do you think Aaron was called, right, Moses and Aaron were called to make vestments, right, that were so spectacular? One, because they were priests of the one holy God, right? but also in some sense because they were renewing that call that God had for Adam to be high priests of Eden. In other words, when you look at the high priest in his robes going into the temple, it's like looking at Adam in the garden before the fall. So let's talk about Adam, the glorious high priest. Letter D. Beyond the above, direct evidence, which indicates Adam's high priestly role, let's return to sacred scripture to examine other evidence of a similar nature. In Exodus, Moses is commanded to fashion precious gems for the temple and for Aaron's vestments, both which reflect the glory of God himself. For example, Exodus 28, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. The Lord does not disdain beauty. In fact, he commands it. Exodus 28, for Aaron's sons you shall make coats and sashes and caps, and you shall make them for glory and for beauty, once again. Now, Genesis does not portray Adam explicitly dressed in such robes, but guess what? Ezekiel does. Ezekiel 28, which we looked at last time. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, it says. And then it lists all these brilliant um, precious gems, right? Diamond and so on. Sapphire. On that day they were created, you were prepared, and the day you were created, they were prepared, you were an anointed guardian cherub. He describes him as like an angel figure, angelic figure. 
I placed you there, remember this? You were on the holy mountain of Eden. Remember I told you last time, Eden is not just a garden, it's a mountain. There it is once again. In the midst of stones of fire, you walked. A number of texts describe Adam's glory. I'm not going to read these for the sake of time, but take a look at them. It describes the glory of Adam, right, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, points one and two there. The Aramaic Targums, which are basically translations from uh, Hebrew into Aramaic, replace the garments of skin in Genesis 3 with garments of glory. The Lord made garments of glory for Adam and his wife from skin, which the serpent had cast off. In other words, they traded the garments of glory for something far lesser, right? So here we have Adam, the royal son of the father. He's the high priest. He's the gloriously robed high priest. But even so, we see Adam's fall and Eve's with him. But we're concentrating here on the figure of Adam, right? Our study is nearly at a close, and while we have limited ourselves to an examination of Genesis 1 and 2, we've got to make a few remarks about Genesis 3, because that's where all this spills out, right? Just wouldn't be clean, complete without it. So, if we have shown that Adam is portrayed as the royal high priest of the temple, and that he was called to serve and worship God and protect his temple, how does all this impact our reading of Genesis 3? It does. The serpent, in Hebrew, the word is nahash. Can you say that one with me? Nahash, right? And you have to think of something much more ferocious than a little uh, green gardener snake, you know? This is a, uh, a fierce figure, a clear and present danger from the world beyond. So what's happening here in Genesis 3 is here's our holy temple, here's our bejeweled priest, and this uh, predator, this unholy thing, is in the temple. And he's confronting Adam's um, helpmate, right? His sir, his helpmate, his wife, Eve. Adam was called to subdue the garden, to name the animals. This is clearly something that Adam doesn't know. It comes from beyond. The very fact that it's in the holy place is a dereliction of Adam's priestly duties. Remember, he's called to protect and guard the temple. Assure its sanctity. Keep out the unclean. He didn't do this. He did not do that. Why not? Moreover, the serpent appears to confront the woman alone. What's that about? Where's Adam? There's actually two possibilities there. And uh, without getting into the nitty-gritty of this, here are the two possibilities. And you can argue both sides, but it's either one or the other. Either he was with Eve and is utterly silent. And in fact, the text of the NAB, how many have an NAB Bible with you? Look it up, you'll see that it says, Adam and Adam who was with her at the very end of that little discussion in Genesis 3, I think it's verse 5, right? Uh, the RSV does not have that, but uh, whether he's there or not, um, there's something, something awry, right? In fact, some ancient texts, uh, ancient extra-biblical texts, suggest that Adam was not there. If you want to do some other reading, look at my little footnote on the life of Adam and Eve, and it talks about how Adam was in another part of the garden. Now, that's apocryphal, but it's working out this idea that clearly some ancient people believed Adam was not there, literally, physically not there. Whether he was there with tape over his mouth or whether he was off somewhere else, right, smoking his pipe, Adam appears to have no role whatsoever in the conversation. Wherever Adam was, what he certainly failed to do was to keep the unclean Nahash out. And what he did do, right, which was consuming the tree of the knowledge of good and evil reveals a failure of priestly service. It's the same thing that Aaron's sons were killed for later, right? And they offered unholy fire. They're repeating Adam's mistake. Adam did not, did not avad and he did not shamar. In other words, he did not worship God, nor did he guard his house. Let's bring it forward to Jesus Christ. Temple worship is sacrificial worship. What Adam was called what was Adam called to sacrifice? I would argue himself. One scholar writes this, Adam's failure to engage this demonic serpent in battle was the result of his unwillingness to lay down his life in defense of the garden sh uh, sanctuary. He failed to offer his life as a priestly sacrifice to God. In this way, we can firstly contrast Adam's priestly identity with Abraham's faithful priestly offering. Adam, Abraham does not withhold his one and only son, right, Isaac. He does not waver. Adam does. Look what, uh, in Genesis, for I know 
that you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your only son, the angel says to, to Abraham, your only son, your one and only son. It becomes Abraham, not Adam, who's the father of the faith. There's a reason a, Adam is not the father of the faith, right? And Abraham is. Abraham did not fail to offer sacrifice, and God credited it to him as righteousness. Even before he offers that sacrifice, he believed, and it says he, God credited it to him as righteousness. So ultimately, Adam's failure points forward to a new Adam. Now, in the Old Testament, that new Adam is Abraham. But that's only in a temporal sense. Ultimately, the new Adam is not Abraham, who dies, right? But Jesus Christ, the eternal high priest, who offered up the sacrifice of his whole being for the sake of his people. Listen to what Hebrews says. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. Better sacrifices. The author of Hebrews is distinguishing Jesus' high priestly identity from the Old Testament priesthood. He's saying it's far superior in every way. For Christ has entered, listen to this, not into a sanctuary made with hands, a copy of the true one, but into heaven itself. Now to appear into the presence of God on our behalf. What is he doing? The author of Hebrews contrasting Jesus, the high priest, firstly with Adam, right? But more importantly, with those fallen high priests of the Old Testament period. He's saying there's no comparison between the two. Nor was it nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place with blood, not his own, for then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. He's talking about here how in the Old Testament period, there was a day of atonement once a year. Uh, just came up recently in the uh, Jewish liturgical calendar, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement, right? And the high priest would enter into, here it is in the tabernacle, but basically into this space right here, right? Once a year and offer um, sacrifice, a sacrifice of a goat offered at the temple, at the altar just outside the holy place right here. Then he would enter in and take some of that blood and he would sprinkle it on what's called the mercy seat over the Ark of the Covenant, right? As a sacrifice for himself and also for Israel. Now, why for himself? Well, while he wore the glorious robes, inside he had to recognize he was a sinful man. In fact, on the turban that the high priest wore, it said, Behold the glory of the Lord, in Hebrew letters. So as you looked at him, what you saw was not him, but you were reminded of who he represents, which is the glory of the perfect God above, right? Hebrews is contrasting that fallen priesthood of the Old Testament, good as it was, important as it was, with the eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ had no need to offer himself repeatedly. By the way, if you're here tonight and you're not Catholic or you're listening on the internet, you're not Catholic and you wonder, isn't that exactly what you Catholics do though? You violate what Hebrews says, right? You offer a bloody sacrifice again and again and again. No, it's a non-bloody sacrifice. There was the bloody sacrifice of Calvary once for all, right? We enter into that at Mass. That's what we do, right? Jesus comes to us, but in another sense, we go to him. We go to the cross. We go to Calvary with him. Nor was it necessary for him to repeatedly offer himself as the high priest enters into the holy place yearly. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the age to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for men to die once and after that the judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. And that's all of us, right? So mysteriously, in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ is the royal high priest, but he's also the offering. Did you catch that? He's the priest who offers the sacrifice, and he's the sacrifice itself. Finally, Jesus Christ, the new temple. Jesus Christ is not only the perfect and eternal high priest, he is at the same time the very temple. Look what Jesus says to his disciples in John chapter 2 while they're at the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. By the way, Jesus never said, I will destroy this temple. He was not anti-temple. Jesus loved the temple. He never said, I will destroy this temple. 
what he's doing is offering a prophecy of what is going to happen, right? And I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it has taken 46 years to, to really rebuild this temple because we're talking about the temple of Herod, which underwent an almost 50-year renovation project. Herod extended it, made it much more opulent than it had ever been in the sec second temple period. Even so, right, 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? Now, this next part is one of my favorite texts in all of St. John. Look at what, this is John going Psst, to us. Psst but he spoke of the temple of his body. He's catechizing us, right? You get the word of Jesus here, and then you get John's catechesis. He spoke of the temple of his body, he's telling us. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples, psst, and that includes me, St. John, right? Remember that he had said this. Illumined by the Holy Spirit, right? They have that holy memory. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Then later in the book of Revelation, we see how this all comes to a spectacular conclusion. You can think of it this way. There are three gardens in Scripture, right? And there are three temples. The three gardens, Garden of Eden, right? The Garden of Gethsemane, and the Garden, if you will, of the New Jerusalem, right? Described in the most Edenic of ways. There's also three temples, right? The Temple of Eden, as we've been looking at, the Temple of Jerusalem, and the temple of Jesus' body. And so focusing now on the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation promises us the sure and glorious transformation that awaits us in the resurrected lamb. Well, we, well, we will be restored to the imago dei and partake in his divine nature. We with him will avad and shamar. We will worship him and keep that temple always. St. John says, And I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light shall all the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. So now we have the vision, right? Not only of Adam, the high priest, going out and fructifying all the earth and, and extending the temple presence, but now all the kings of the earth coming to it. Just what God always intended of his holy temple, that there would be a place for the Gentiles, right? The court of the Gentiles, in some sense, says, you may not be God's chosen, but you're welcome in this holy place. Maybe in the outer perimeter, but you're there, and one day, kings will stream into it. The book of Isaiah also talks about how one day there will be priests who come from the pagans, from the Gentiles. Wow. Wow. Does that not remind you of something? The book of Isaiah looks forward to the new temple and the new priesthood. By its light shall the nations walk, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it, and its gates shall never be shut. By day and there shall be no night. They shall bring into it the glory and honor of the nations, shall stream to this temple. Something that never happened in Jesus' day, right, will happen in the eschaton at the end of time. In the meantime, you might say in the here and now, what are we to do? We participate in the kingdom of God. And in the age of the new evangelization, here is a final challenge to us all. In the light of the above, one can only conclude that Adam's kingly and priestly activity in the garden was to be a beginning fulfillment, just a beginning, of the original commission in Genesis 1 and was not limited to the garden's original earthly boundaries, but was to be extended over the whole world. In other words, once again, Adam was called to go, right? Go and be fruitful and multiply. Go and bring order and perfection, God's order and perfection. Go sacramentalize the world. Adam's role, one scholar writes, was to spread God's luminescent presence, by extending the boundaries of the original Eden temple into all the earth. And you get a sense of that in the book of Ezekiel, where he describes this new and glorious temple which grew, and streams of living water flew, flowed out in every direction. Let us go, let us make disciples, right? Jesus Christ, the new high priest, is the new Adam. The first commission in Genesis 1:28: be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The great commission of the true Adam Go and make disciples. 
Jesus is inviting us into this temple building mission. That's nothing other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is prefigured in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 1 and 2. Now, um, just if I can make a final appeal, and I want to read the prayer from Pope Francis, because there's a lot of implications here, right? Let's just stop for a minute and consider some of the implications, right? Um, there are many. Boy, if we had, you know, to turn this into a little discussion, right, after the break, what would that look like? If you run the table, here's the discussion question. What are the implications of this, of this uh, uh, liturgy of creation, right, last week and this week? I think it'd be lots. We'd be talking about the sacraments, be talking about our children, all kinds of things. But I know most of you here are Catholic. Um, but some of you, and I've met some of you, are here, and I'm so glad you're here, who are not yet a part of our church. And you're welcome here. You're always welcome at the Institute. Some of you are listening online and have a spouse who is Catholic, but you may not be. And I want to speak directly to, to such people. If you were with us last week and this week, um, I think that you've obviously, like the rest of us, have a lot to contemplate. But I hope you will pray about and think about what it means to read Scripture with the wisdom of the church. It's not my wisdom. It's not the Institute's wisdom, per se. It's the wisdom of the church, the wisdom of the ages. Um, there are many ways that some interpretations of Genesis have been flawed and I would say even harmful. I alluded to one of them a moment ago when I talked about the helpmate, right? We didn't get into that, uh, into the complementary relationship, but there has been notions out there, and they're pretty common, in fact, which have done a detriment to the uh, complementary relationship between the man and the woman. The Catholic faith has the beautiful answer to that question, too. Tonight we're exploring a different theme, but in terms of Genesis, the Catholic faith has a beautiful answer. If you're out there and you've been injured by this idea as a woman or as a man or confused about it, the Catholic interpretation is beautiful, is glorious, and lifts up the dignity of both man and woman. In terms of ecology, there's a lot on the table right now, right? Politicians talking about it tonight on CNN, I'm sure they will be, right? All through this next year and a half. What's a Catholic response? What is our role in ecology and being stewards of the earth? Is it simply some tacked on to some political agenda, left, right, or center? Read Laudato Si, read what Pope Benedict says, right? He says we care for the earth, right? Because when we care for the earth, we're caring for humanity because all of God's creation is here ultimately as part, we're connected to the creation. He never thinks about uh, environmentalism for its own sake as an agenda or an ideology, but always as it uh, points to the dignity of every person. Again, I would argue the Catholic faith has a wisdom and beauty that is so deep. Now, I didn't intend to close this with a kind of an evangelical pitch, but I want to say if you're here tonight and maybe this is one of those nights to pray about and contemplate where you're at in your walk of faith. And if you're listening online, where you're at in your walk of faith. I just heard about a very famous uh, person in the news who made their way into the, uh, the Catholic faith, a commentator on uh, one of the news channels. Um, and um, I invite you to pray about doing the same. And if you're not ready to make that jump and you're outside of the Catholic faith, we welcome you here. You're welcome at the Institute. Keep learning and growing. And I think you're going to find, uh, in aside to the uh, rich scripture study, many other ways to grow in your faith. If you're interested, one final um, logistical note, if you're interested in this temple theme, I have a, just a couple copies left, a few people dove in. Um, I partner with a group called Catholic Productions, and they are allowing me to offer a discounted price on my series, uh, The House of the Lord, which is a um, basically 25-hour scripture study of the Old and New Testament and the temple theme from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. And you read about that in the notes. But let me offer this as a final closing prayer, and then we'll take our break, I think. Uh, from Pope Francis, this is how he ends Laudato Si. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Father, we praise you with all your creatures. They came forth from your all-powerful hand. They are yours, filled with your presence and your tender love. Praise be to you. Son of God, Jesus, through you all things were made. You were formed in the womb of Mary, our mother. You became part of this earth, and you gazed upon this world with human eyes. Today you are alive in every creature in your risen glory. Praise be to you. 
Holy Spirit, by your light, you guide this world towards the Father's love and accompany creation as it groans in travail. You also dwell in our hearts as you inspire us to do what is good. Praise be to you. Try you, Lord, wondrous community of infinite love. Teach us to contemplate you in the beauty of the universe, for all things speak of you. Awaken our praise and thankfulness for every being that you have made. Give us the grace to feel profoundly joined to everything that is. God of love, show us our place in this world as channels of your love for all the creatures of this earth, for not one of them is forgotten in your sight. Enlighten those who possess power and money that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may love the common good, advance the weak, and care for this world in which we live. The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us protect all life to prepare for a better future, for the coming of your kingdom of justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you. And everyone said, Amen. amen. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Thanks, guys. Actually, it's a request for a little perspective on this. Uh, you talked about um, Adam's role as a high priest in the garden and the duties of a high priest. I think as a Catholic or maybe even as a Christian, you grow up with a story of Adam and Eve as Adam's the first guy. He's the, you know, appears naked and created and, and there's maybe not a lot of other people around. And then you said when the serpent's in, in the garden, it's a dereliction of Adam's priestly duties just by the mere fact that he's there. And then later go on to say that he's, uh, when he didn't engage the serpent in uh, combat or something, he failed to offer his life as a priestly sacrifice. Can, I wasn't here the first week. Can you put in perspective how, how was Adam a, a fully had all this knowledge in his head? I mean, if you're the first guy on earth, I don't think your perspective is, you know, from my very limited yeah. knowledge of the human. Yeah, fully formed or, yeah, advanced, yeah. Do you understand? I think I do, yeah. How, did, Adam, did Adam realize the story he was in, sort of, right? Did he understand what's going on here? Yeah. Well, yeah, I give a sh try to give a short answer to that. Um, last week we talked about the, uh, the importance of reading uh, Genesis with the right lenses on. And I suggested that um, people who read uh, Genesis in a, with the scientific glasses on and only scientific glasses miss the point of the story because they say, ah, it's just a bunch of you know, mythic fairy tales and that doesn't help get at the, you know, at the um, complexity of our uh, physical world. Uh, okay, well, they're reading with a certain lens on that brings an expectation to the text. In the same way, another problem is, I would argue, the fundamentalist Christian who reads uh, with another set of lenses on, and that is that, uh, you know, the world was created just literally as it says in the text. So seven days of creation, the world's 6,000 years old, and all that. Okay, both of those we talked about are kind of, in my view, flawed views, right? Uh, flawed lenses of looking at the text. And we talked last week, and I think there may be some notes back, back there, or maybe you can get them from, um, from Margaret, uh, that there is something called form, literary form and content in every passage of Scripture. The literary form is just the shape and style, the genre, as it were, of how it's presented. So we get these seven days of creation, right? But the substance is what's really critical underneath it. Now, to your question, um, how, does that help, how does that help us understand what Adam may have grasped or comprehended. Um, that's unknowable, I think, right, from our perspective, that we can only read the text and what the reflection is, right, by the author of Genesis. Um, clearly, from the author's perspective, Adam had a capacity to understand that he was not alone. He had a capacity to understand he was created in God's image, right? He had a capacity to understand that all the animals were um, not like him, that he was different, and then when Eve was given, that she was this great gift. He had an instinct, right, given by God to consummate his relationship with his wife, right? He was fruitful and multiplied. So I would say in some sense, Adam has, uh, exhibits a, um, an understanding, a self-understanding, but I don't know that we can possibly answer the question, unfortunately, how much he knew, because that's the mystery of, um, 
of Scripture is that it's the, it's the human author under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we need that so much. Let me give you an uh, uh, analogy, maybe take another question here. Um, I, I well, sometimes ask students, do you think if we let a camera roll on the life of Jesus, we would understand better or, or less well the life and ministry of Jesus? And they always say, oh, better, right? And then I say, well, okay, let's get real narrow. Let's take the camera and put the Jesus cam on Jesus at Cana. We would miss a lot of what actually the evangelist says about him in reflection. At the end of the wedding feast at Cana, John says, thus Jesus revealed his glory to his disciples and his disciples believed in him. Jesus doesn't say that, right? That comes from the reflection of the writer of scripture. So my point is that we need the writers of Scripture, whether it's the author of Genesis or the authors of the Gospels, to help inform us, to illuminate our minds according to what the Holy Spirit wants to teach us. So Adam and the prophets of the Old Testament probably had a very limited knowledge in some respects. We have the joy and privilege of reading the Scripture through the lens of 2,000 years. So we're in a much better position probably than Adam to understand what Adam was actually going through. But um, I encourage you to get the CD or the uh, notes from last week because there was a lot there. But thank you for the question. You stated, what is a temple without a priest and that J Jesus Christ was both priest and sacrifice? I immediately think of our bodies are temples to the Lord. The law is written on our hearts. We are a nation of priests and we are to be living sacrifices. Please help. Okay. So I think... Okay. So I think what Peter's asking is, how does this temple idea make its way through the rest of Scripture? Because he's referring to texts, I think, by St. Paul. St. Paul says a number of things. Um, for example, he says, you are, at one point he says, you are the temple of God. And he, the you is a plural, you all. So he says about the church, you are the temple of God. But then in another place, he says to individuals in the church, your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit. So how does that fit in with this? Well, I would say that the whole temple motif carries all the way through from Genesis all the way forward through the Old Testament into the Gospels and certainly uh, ends up in the lap of St. Paul, right? Um, Paul, I think, is aware of this idea and he draws upon it, but like scripture, he builds upon it, right? He builds upon it and he changes it. So when he says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, well, wait a minute, I thought Jesus' body was the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Well, Paul would say yes, but also your bodies, right, are little temples of the Holy Spirit. In another place, he clarifies this, our relationship to Jesus the temple, when he says, and I'm paraphrasing, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and we are members of his body, right? So it's like he's saying, okay, I know Jesus said he's the temple, right? John chapter 2, which we read but Paul's saying, let's take that further. Let's take that metaphor and reality further. Jesus' body is indeed the temple, right? But it's the cornerstone of the temple. That's what Paul does. So he takes it and he shifts it, makes it more precise. Jesus is now the cornerstone for Paul, and we are bricks or stones that are attached like brick and mortar to that temple. So for Paul, it's not a negation of saying Jesus' body is the temple. It's a both and, and that's always the Catholic way, it seems, right? The both and. Is that Jesus is the cornerstone of the temple, and we become joined to him through the sacrament of baptism, which, by the way, just ha have to give a shout out. I had a chance this weekend with my wife to visit a holy transfiguration, and we saw what was just the most amazing and astounding baptism, and um, the priest gave a very uh, insightful um, homily on what baptism really is. And sometimes if I think if we really contemplate what is happening at baptism, I think it would blow our eyes out of our heads. You know, pardon the expression, but yeah. I, I uh, refer uh, to Adam's assignment to worship, serve, and minister. And I think of Jesus at the Last Supper, washing the feet, serving, and worshiping. And uh, am I see my question am i seeing this correctly you are seeing it right dear i mean I, I think i would invite you come on sunday night because we're going to get more into how jesus recapitulates or perfects the creation of the old testament adam creation all of israel are all consumed in a holy fire in jesus's life death and resurrection thank you so much glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be or without end, amen. I will see you hopefully on Sunday night. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture.
If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.